<laughs> and why do they sound like right. they're a 13 year old kid? All right, I, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to use Aaron <laughs> Rodgers. I'm not going to answer even that. If, even if I knew the answer, I'm not telling you. Our question of the day What will be the biggest in game difference what about this us? year? This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interviews and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. It is Baylor week for BYU football. And joining us now to discuss BYU's second matchup with the Bears in as many years is former NFL and BYU linebacker standout David Nixon. David, the challenge gets just a little bit more significant mm, this year. Just a little bit. This week, I should say, with BYU turning the page to Baylor. Uh, by the way, we just found out the Associated Press poll is not going to come out until noon Mountain Time. That's 2 p.m. Eastern. So we will not have BYU's updated ring. But let's start there. Good where, thing we prepared two topics in the <laughs> block. Where would you put BYU in this week's top 25, and where would you put Baylor? In your biased opinion, what do you think? In my biased opinion, I think BYU moves up two spots. I, you know, I, there wasn't there weren't a lot of teams that lost in front of BYU. Yeah. And then you have teams like Florida that, that beat Utah that probably would leapfrog BYU today. So I think BYU goes up a couple spots. They took care of business as everyone anticipated they would. Um, so nothing's too surprising. It wasn't like they went out there and beat a Baylor team this week to, to start the season. So they beat Baylor's quarterback. What are you talking about? That is true. Yeah, that is true. Uh, but I, I think they fall right there in line with you know one or two spots. Um, it'd be fun if they moved up more. But I think realistically it's one or two. Yeah, okay. I, I I believe in my also biased opinion. Uh, the BYU should have started yeah. around 17 and. Be around 17 yep. right now. Where do you feel like BYU should be if, if uh, you know, yep. all things were considered? Because it feels like they are not at the moment. I agree. I think they're a top 20 team. I thought they were preseason as well, uh, given the returning production, as yep. we know. Uh, 85% of the team re- returned this year. So the team that was number 19 to finish last year, and they bring back the most production of any team in college football. Correct. Yeah, I agree. I was shocked. With that being said, I was on here a couple weeks ago where I said I love the position they're in. I, I like the fact – you, you don't want to be like the team of North where you are overinflated, right? And, you're, and when I say that, you don't want guys thinking you're better than you are. Uh, so it's tough when you have a top 10 ranking. You have to live up, live up to the hype. I remember that. In yeah, o- sometimes 08. you quest for perfection. It's tough. You right? get to, you know, we've talked about this in the past. You get to a certain spot where, man, you, there is actually a lot of weight on your shoulders knowing that you're a top 10 team. You had to defend that ranking week in and week out. I mean, it goes back to when we played Utah State my senior year up there at Utah State. I was talking about this with someone last week. And we're up, I think, tw- <laughs> 21 points, and we had kind of our, our second third stringers in, and the Utah State fans started chanting, overrated to us. <laughs> and we're up, we're up 21. Uh, and so there's, there's some oh. expectations that come with that high ranking. So I think BYU deserves somewhere in the 15 to 20. They got 25, and I, but I actually like that spot where you're at because at least you're in the top 25. Um, and now you can just only move up from there if you keep winning. Obviously. Sure. This sure. goes away next year, though. Because if BYU does it in the Big 12, they instantly get that yeah, credibility, totally. I, I think. Maybe it takes a year or two. But we're not going to have this, well, who'd they play again? And what ha-? Like, we know what happened. But not everyone is like, yeah, 5-0 and over versus the Pac-12, 6-1 versus the Pac-12. They don't know all this stuff, but Agreed. they will. Agreed. I think the, I think the G5 effect uh, came into play with the ranking, preseason ranking, where BYU kind of got shafted a little sure, bit. Sure, sure. If, if you had this exact same team and you were already in the Big 12, I agree. I think you're probably 15, 16, 17. We, BYU right. might be overinflated at that point. Yeah. Who, yeah, who yeah, knows? Maybe. We maybe. might be in hey, that game. Yeah. And then if BYU loses a bowl game to a G5, we just go, eh, we weren't motivated. Yeah, we didn't want to play. Yeah. 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 Expect Baylor to move up maybe a spot. I, I think They'll the be top 10. Yeah. Number, number nine coming yeah. to Provo. Uh, that said, with, with week one happening, have your expectations shifted for BYU at all in terms of win-loss? I'm, I'm kind of like, I feel better about BYU sweeping through the G5s. Yeah. Uh, kind of got them at like nine and a half wins. Uh, it could go either way, up to ten, down to nine. There's where do you, where do you stay somewhere. on that after one week? Yeah, I don't think they've shifted much. I think, if anything, uh, the only reason it shifted is because watching the other teams BYU faces, right? Boise State did not look good. I watched that game. Utah State, well, they played Alabama. They didn't look great, but they didn't look great week one. They didn't look good against UConn. Yeah, yeah, exactly what I'm saying. They didn't look great week one. Um, They might... They might I – mean, Utah State is Utah State. They're going to get up for BYU, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so my, I guess my expectations shifted just based off BYU's opponents. Mm-hmm. Um, but you still look – I mean, Arkansas against Ar- – big consistency now, they look great. They look really good. Uh, Oregon, of course, didn't look great against, against Georgia, but that's Georgia. I mean, those are Alabama, Georgia, Ohio, you know, State. Ohio State. Those three are kind of the three – like, hey, we give you a pass on those. Those are pretty difficult teams. Um, but, you know, uh, you look at BYU's schedule, Notre Dame looked pretty good yeah. against Ohio yeah. State. So – I don't know. I, I, I still – I thought BYU would have a 9-3 type season. I, I really did. I think you, you, you maybe drop one against Notre Dame. Um, Arkansas is going to be a tough one. And maybe this Baylor game. But other yeah. than that, I think BYU has a great shot. Even Oregon. I think they match up well against Oregon. It, 
And if BYU beats Baylor, 10-2 and two is still possible, it feels like. If BYU loses to Baylor, now, now it's kind of 9-3-ish. and three -ish. Because the hope, I don't know how you feel about it, but probably on the same page, is split against the big four. Yeah. You got to get at least a split. Now, Baylor, huge game at home. You hope to defend home turf, as Spencer has said. At Oregon feels more winnable. I don't want to overreact to one game, especially against Georgia. But also, uh, I want to react properly to how, BYU, how well BYU played, especially in that first half. So what do you think of at Oregon next week? Because we take it two games at a time on this <laughs> Yeah, we don't take it the next one. week. The team no. takes it one, we take it two games. Uh, I think the key to the Oregon game is how healthy does BYU come out against this week against, against Baylor good, and how banged, up they, how banged up they come out of it. Because I think this is going to be a very – what we saw last year, it's a slugfest. And when you're playing Big 12, especially a Baylor team, the Jeff Grimes team that loves to run it and cram it down your throat, as we saw last year, um, I think health is going to be a huge deal this week. And so BYU can come out relatively unscathed. Uh, I think they have a great shot next week. But if they come out banged up, that's okay. tough to go on the road against the Oregon spread team and try to fit new guys in on that defense specifically. That's a tough one. But I, after watching these USF game, the way that BYU came out, jumped on them, and what I loved about it most was they kept their foot on the gas pedal. They didn't let up. Um, 38 to nothing at one point. And, yeah, you maybe let up a, very, a little bit at the end when you put the second and third stringers in uh, and, and, you, and you kept Puka out. Uh, and, and special teams was the real issue in this game. Two of those scores are directly yep. and, and mostly indirectly off. Two great kick returns, of course. To totally agree. And that was something that, you know, Kalani and I think uh, and Lamb and the rest of the coaching staff are looking at. And, you know, this is, that's, a, that's something they've done for years where they try to put the ball in, the, in a corner – to pin, to pin the return team between basically the hashes and the sideline. And they try to put it on anywhere from the you know, goal line to the five-yard line. Try to pin them in that corner. And they feel like the pursuit team, the coverage team, get down there and stop them before they get to the 20 or 25, sure, right? Sure, sure. Um, but this is one of those – you go back and watch the film. We'll break it down on AFR. There were a lot of really bad angles, yes. which it's kind of expected in week one, right? A lot of bad angles, uh, a lot of missed tackles, uh, and a couple of guys just – Kind of being too lax, sure, and, and, sure. and that guy is legit, Dude, Brian Batty. Yeah, yeah, Brian Batty, he, like, he's legit, returning first team yeah. All American kick returner. So it was probably, I mean, up thirty eight nothing. I'm fine with this because yeah. you used it as live action to defend one of the. Yeah, best. Yeah, Kalani told me it's probably my fault because I was like, no, this is a really good kickoff return. You guys need to figure out how to cover totally. against these type I'm, teams. I'm fine with that. In, in that scenario that they that happened, I, I agree. It if is the game's good. tied, no way. No way. You're kicking out of bounds. Or you're kicking out of the back of the end zone. Or out of bounds. Yeah, or out of bounds. How much you respect yeah. them. <laughs> with what happened, yeah. <laughs> like, out of bounds is probably give better. Give them the ball to 40. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I overall, I went back and watched the game again last night. Overall, I mean, everyone, they, everything was clicking all cylinders, which is exactly what you want in week one. Typically, there's rust you have to shake off. But this year against USF, they came out firing, especially after that delay. I mean, that delay is tough. Sure. Uh, because that, oh that, my that, gosh, that's yeah. worse. Especially when you're the busy team. Home team, you're familiar with the stadium. You, can, you, know, you kind of feel like it's your home, so you can kind of relax a little more. Busy team, it's all new territory, so you're kind of uptight, and it's, it's a tough one. David Nixon is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Did you learn anything about BYU's defense that you didn't know before? Did you see anything that was a little bit different than maybe you expected? Uh, no, I, I thought they performed the way I thought they should, especially with all the guys healthy, right? Uh, I did see a little more man-to-man -man, uh, in, in that game, which BYU frankly got burned a couple times on some cover zeros. So uh, we'll break that down as well. But um, all in all, I thought they, they, they came out and played. Just, I mean, Keenan Peely was on fire. Peyton Wilgar had some fantastic plays. The D-line had some good surge. Um, when you look at the line of scrimmage, BYU is playing on their side of the line of scrimmage, which is obviously the key to the game. Uh, and, so they, and then they created a turnover. So I, I, I thought all in all, in all um, you know, and then also USF was one of four on, on fourth down. BYU did a great job. of yeah. I mean, Those are quote-unquote turnovers as well. That's an area that BYU struggled in last year, mm -hmm. getting off the field on third and short uh, and fourth and yeah. short. Yeah, BYU offensively two of two. Uh, they were 100% on the day. So it was, it was the deal like inside your own yeah. 45? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That which, was, which was gutsy. And you know what? Sure. When you look back at that play call and, and, and the fact that BYU and Kalani decided to go for it, I love it. Because that sent a signal to your team as well. Guys, we can do this, right? I got confidence in you. And it sent a signal not only to the offense, but also to the defense. Defense, I know that if we don't get this, I know you guys can step up and stop them. And offensively, I got faith in you. Let's go. I got confidence. Get, that, get those two, three yards. Or you're just like Caleb Hayes if you missed the story yesterday. He grabs his helmet, puts it on. They get, hey, defense, get ready. We're going for that fourth and down. It happened twice. He's like, I'm not putting on my helmet next time. I trust my offense. <laughs> it's a waste of energy. It's conserve the energy. Did you ever withhold putting on your helmet thinking Max is getting uh, the first down? All the time. All the time. I'm serious. Like, it would, it would, they'd, sell, they'd yell like third, fourth down alert. 
And I'd just be like, I, I mean, it's third and four. We have it, we're like 100% on the season with this number. <laughs> You're like, Dennis is going to yeah. catch up for so, us. Somebody's going to get open. Dennis. Harvey, come out of backfield. Like, I, I'm not worried about this at all. You literally didn't move. <laughs> you were just on the bench. Damn it! Like, it's warm over here. I mean, also, you have to know the guys are yelling, hey, third down, fourth down alert. Like, they're kind of annoying. So it's like, <laughs> it's like just be quiet. I, I can see the game on the Jumbotron. I don't need you to remind I'm me. I'm aware what down yeah. it is, okay? I, I, yeah, I don't know a lot, but I know that. Yeah, that's funny. Okay, so with Baylor. Where do you feel like BYU perhaps has some advantages? Because last year was tough. BYU gave up 309. They were on skates defensively. They stopped Tyler Algier. It was a run versus run defense game. Do you feel like it's that again? I, I think it is, but I have more confidence going in this year knowing the guys are healthy. I mean, you look back at last year, no Keenan Peely, right? Um, Peyton Wilgar was banged up. Peyton, guys were already banged up at that point in the season. And so I have much more confidence knowing that our horses are back in full strength uh, compared to last year. Um, and frankly, one more year of experience – uh, and film going against a Jeff Grimes t- type run team, right? And so, yeah, I, you know, you look at the numbers offensively, BYU and Baylor put up almost identical offensive numbers. They're both 570, 80 yards within, they're within like 10 yards of each other, what they did against their opponents this last weekend. Um, and so I think it's going to be an offensive slugfest, but defensively, I think this BYU defense is ready for this test. Okay. Just given, given, given what they did last year and also in week one and having all the guys back. I'm with you, man. I feel like stop the run. Stop the run. You, you have win to. this game. I mean, that's always the key, but specifically it's Baylor and a Jeff Grimes offense. You have to stop the run. That's, that's where they hang their hat on. David Nixon, great to talk with you, man. Looking forward to more on uh, after further review. Hey, always fun to break down a win. We love breaking down always. wins. Always. It's been a fun last few years, so let's, uh, we'll have fun tonight. There's some great – I was looking at the clips yesterday. There's, uh, there's some fun clips we're going to break down. You've only broken down four losses in, since the end of 2019. Yeah, I mean, but that, that's that makes crazy. up for the – what was it, four and eight year? Four, four and nine. nine. Four and yeah. nine. Four nine. Yeah. It makes up for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was a rough year. You <laughs> seven and six. Hey, had some fun wins. Kalani's record is outstanding in spite of the four and nine mark. He's he about to, he's going for win 50. Yeah. Win 50. Let's go. Saturday. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Joining us now to uh, give the Baylor perspective on things and how they might be different this year compared to last year is the voice of the Baylor Bears, John Morris. He's back. Of the program. He's back with us. John, great to have you on BYU Sports Nation. How are you? Great to be back with you guys. Looking forward to the game. And that, that music, that's a little intense. Is, yeah. that the, <laughs> is that the feeling we're getting about this game? I think so. Uh, we've been yeah. talking about it. BYU's only beaten a top 10 team five times ever at the time of the game. And so, yeah, huge opportunity here. But also for Baylor, obviously you have league play, but if you want to compete for a playoff spot, uh, you certainly got to walk in with zero or one losses. So this is a huge game for both. It absolutely is. I, I think it's one of three uh, rank versus rank games uh, in all of college football this weekend. So, And then the late night, uh, you know, Big 12 uh, after dark is, is yes. pretty cool. You know, it's late for us and, and not as late for you guys, but I think it's going to get a lot of attention, a lot of eyeballs. There'll be promotion all day long on Saturday for this game. So it, it's, a, it's a really good buildup for what I think is a really good matchup. Okay, John, we obviously want to do our part and help you in any way that we can. And a big part of that is I know you're a pro, so you probably don't need some help, but just in case – are there any name pronunciations you need help with on the BYU <laughs> side? Because it's all it's always crazy. Yeah. Only about a dozen or so, okay? So uh, let's touch base Saturday okay. in the press box. And uh, I've been working on that, looking at it all week. So, I, yes, I do need your help in that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it, it's always fun, right? Uh, especially, you know, the long Polynesian names. They, they're pretty yeah. – they're more simple than you think. Uh, we got you. We got yeah. you. Let's talk about this matchup because certainly – there are several players on both sides who aren't in this game from last year that played a big role, notably the starting running backs and running backs for Baylor, of course, Tyler Ogier for BYU, of course. They're gone, but it still feels like this is a run versus run defense on both sides of the ball game that will determine how this game goes. How do you feel about it? Does it come down to that? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, just in the trenches, one of those in the trenches, very physical game, uh, which line can dominate the other line. Uh, Last year in Waco, that was a huge part of the Baylor win. I think we ran the ball for 303 yards last year and and really contained Tyler Algier pretty well. Um, I think uh, BYU had 67 total yards rushing last year in that Baylor win in Waco. So that is a uh, key 
part of the game on Saturday. And I think, uh, you know, new new faces back there. Certainly Tyler Algiers now with the Atlanta Falcons. But uh, Chris Brooks is there, had a real good opener. And for us, we've got several guys that are kind of trying to make that stand as, as the number one back. But right now, I think you're going to get three or four different backs from Baylor. John, we've been talking about uh, the late night window, and certainly, um, I mean, it's it, Big 12 After Dark, as you said, is, is a lot of fun. How much of a difference do you feel like that game time, the location, is going to make an impact on, on how this game plays out compared to the afternoon in Waco last year? Well, uh, to me, those are two different things. Game time is one thing. Uh, location is a, is a huge factor because you remember uh, we had a great crowd. It was a beautiful day, just perfect weather, mid-afternoon game here in Waco last year. This is late night when our guys have to sit around the hotel all day, a long day out there. And uh, sometimes that's a factor. I think coaches would tell you they want to play as early as they can on the road and not have to sit around and, and keep the guys occupied all day. And then there's your crowd, which I understand is just terrific at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. So we got to contend with that also. So uh, it, it's going to be tough. Baylor has a tough road schedule this year. We play in Provo. Later we'll play in Ames. We'll play in Norman. We'll play in Austin. So a really tough road schedule. And this is the first test for some guys who maybe haven't been in that kind of environment before. Yeah, well, notably uh, Blake Shapin. He, he, he's played in big games, no doubt about it. Uh, big 12 championship, bowl game. This, this kind of feels like the first hostile road environment that Blake has played in. Uh, why do you feel like he's ready for that challenge? Well, he's just, it's just his personality. You know, it's just his makeup. He is he is a really cool customer back there. Uh, you know, he's a first time, you know, full full time starter for us. He did start two games last year, but came into this year as our number one quarterback. And he's just handled it so well. And he he just has the uh, personality and the makeup that I think, you know, it won't the stage won't be too big for him. So I, I really don't have any concerns about that just because I, I have complete faith in him. Now, the BYU defense, that's a different story story coming after him but just personality wise I think he'll be able to handle it do you expect Dylan Doyle to have two of the three of the following a rushing or receiving TD and sack like he had all three last year Oh, man, is that a bingo game we're going to play? You know, <laughs> can you get three of these again? Uh, I, I wouldn't have expected that last year, uh, but it happened. And to be completely honest with you, I've seen no signs. Well, I'll take that back. Dylan Doyle came in in short yardage situation last week in the win over Albany as a fullback. So I've seen that, and that could happen again. Uh, but to think that he could, you know, maybe be our leading tackler and rush for a touchdown and, run, and catch a touchdown pass – I don't think I could predict that, but uh, maybe it's in there. I, th I think you will see him on short yardage uh, as a fullback on offense. BYU comes into this game uh, and put what you stock you will into lines and experts as a three to four point favorite. And so we're just like, wait a second. Baylor's number nine, BYU's number 21. We know the location's probable, but BYU's the favorite in this game. Does Baylor feel like they're coming in as the underdog? I don't know, but I would guess our coaches would use that to their benefit, right? Say, come on, you're getting disrespected. You know, you're an underdog going into this game. So it, whatever works, whatever the coaches will use whatever works. Yeah. Um, I, I would say to me, uh, you know, that's not a surprise, really. What do, you, what do you get three points for home field advantage? Typically. So that means it's basically a pick em game or, you know, or BYU by one. So I, I don't deal much in that or don't spend much time thinking about it. I, I think it's going to be a great matchup. I think it's two really good teams, really physical teams, two top 25 teams squaring off. So, you know, let's kick it off and see how things play out. Uh, Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark has said, uh, you know, he's open for business as it relates to expansion. He was asked about it when he visited Cincinnati. He all but targeted what we think he was talking about, Oregon perhaps, uh, who's probably eyeing the Big 10 as well. What are your thoughts on Big 12 expansion? Are you hoping the league does expand in the future? Well, uh, you'll be surprised to know that's a little above my pay grade. Nobody's asking my opinion. <laughs> John, no one's watching on this show. It's just us. <laughs> okay, just us talking. <laughs> Uh, I, I like Brett Yormark. I like that he is aggressively, uh, you know, running our conference now. You know, he's not passively standing behind and standing back and seeing what happens. Uh, I like that. I think that's a new Big 12 
with Brett Yormark in charge. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. I, I uh, kind of trust him implicitly, you know, even though I don't know him, haven't known him that long since the middle of July was the first time I met him. But I really trust him and the decisions he's uh, already made and about to make. And so I think, you know, I, I think he's very smart also. You know, he's not going to drop that nugget you know, about expanding West and, you know, giving some giving some hints on who it might be unless he wants to, you know, he wants to send that message out there. So uh, more power to him. It'll be fun to see how things play out. I'm going to be completely forthright. When you said our conference, it made me feel very happy inside that BYU is now in the Big 12. I'm, feel, I'm feeling I'm good vibes with, right yes, now. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, we'll finish with this, John. Uh, we roll out uh, what we call our completely unbiased – Big 12 plus four power rankings every week. Uh, okay. <laughs> and so I, there are a lot of teams there. I'm just going to ask you, what, what are your top five teams in the Big 12 right now, including the new four teams that are coming in? How would you rank those top five teams? Ooh, good question. Um, a little bit tough to do, don't you think, yes. after last week, after the games last week? You know, I think we'll know a lot more after this weekend's uh, round of games. But if you're holding my feet to the fire and uh, saying, what are they right now? I'm going to say Baylor, BYU, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State. How about that for the top four? Okay. What what did you say? What did you say? In that, well, we're going to reveal it next segment. Uh, we got to oh, tease okay. it. But I want to stay tuned. Can I stay on? Yes, with you? yes, you absolutely, can. you can. Yes, absolutely. You can. And John, we have five hours to fill a week. We got to come up with this crazy content. Okay, we just got to do it. That's good stuff. <laughs> I'm glad to be part of your five hours. We're looking yes. forward to the trip to Provo, and uh, I look forward to many more visits in the future. We're really excited about BYU being a part of the Big Twelve. Fantastic, John. You're a class act. We appreciate your time. We'll see you in Provo. Safe travels to you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. He is at Voice of Bears on Twitter. At what, Voice what of a Bears. Handle. I like it. Yes. Great guy. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Brother Taysom Hill's $10.1 million salary this year makes him the ninth highest paid tight end in the NFL. Will he be a top 10 tight end this season? If the Saints utilize him properly, yes. Why not? Why would you not throw the ball and target Taysom Hill specifically if you want him to be a primary tight end? My concern is they just won't utilize him enough in that position. He's not currently the starter at tight end for even the Saints. Yeah, that's Adam Troutman. Um, we if paid him 10 million bucks. Well, part of that was just in case he was a quarterback. He's also um, the backup quarterback. Well, third string, but yeah, because they have Randy Dalton as well. Um, if he's a top 20 tight end in the NFL, that would be incredible. That would be, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Incredible. Like, For him to just jump into the top 10 is like quite a stretch. But if he's top 20, honestly, that's amazing. Right now, top 15 PFF, you'd have to be better than Zach Ertz of the Cardinals. Like, that feels like that's a lot. Because how's he going to be as a blocker? Like, obviously, as a pass catcher, it's going to be awesome. But uh, how is he in the run game? Well, and how much will they utilize him in other places? Is he going to return kicks? Is he going to play on special teams? Is he going to do all the other things that he has done this point? Or is he just a tight end? Yeah, and my comments are just about being a tight right. end. If, if you're looking at all the ways he can affect the game, yeah, he's worth $10 million. Sure. For sure, for sure. That's an yeah. easy tithing, tithing math right there. Top 10 tight end? That's a lot to ask. <laughs> Unless he's the starting tight end, which he is not. Yeah, and maybe they use two effectively. We'll see. Does this year's BYU-Utah rivalry escalate in men's basketball specifically, to a new level with three members of last year's team now joining the team up north. Assistant coach Chris Burgess, Gavin Baxter, and announced yesterday Hunter Erickson. Not really. It'll be good to see those guys. There's no vitriol. It's all friendly and fun with those guys. Chris is going back to where he played his last two years of college. It was fun to have him here while we had him. He's a good coach. No, I don't, I don't feel those feelings as it pertains to those guys. Uh, I feel it a little bit because I'm, I'm, I wish Gavin Baxter were still at BYU. I love Gavin. I do too. I saw him after the Killers concert last Tuesday walking across the street. What's up, Gav? Uh, I saw it. That, that, one, that one stinks. I'm like, ah, I wish Gavin would have finished his career at BYU, but sure. I love the kid. I'm happy for him. I hope he does well. But that, if there were something that would escalate it for me, it's like Gavin choosing Utah over BYU. That escalates it up just a little bit. And if me. Gavin has this monster game and Utah wins, that, that, yes. now those feelings emerge a little well, bit. Right? We should add this, just another little element. It's the Gideon George shoe game, BYU-Utah. So, I mean, 
There are a lot of things happening here in the rivalry. There's a feel good with the Gideon George, but then maybe some not so feel good. There's all a those feel guys bad because it's defecting to the other side. Utah. Yeah. Do we feel that BYU women's soccer being ranked 13th is about where they belong? Yes. Rankings are uh, at this point in the season, they are given as to what you have accomplished. Okay. You have, BYU has earned number 13. Like I know they've been in the top 10 all year, but frankly, when you tie Colorado at home. You lose to an unranked Alabama at home, and really oh, only have unranked. you really only have the road win at Ohio State to your credit. Yep. Like so, there's some give and take. I feel like yeah, BYU is probably right where they belong. Now that's not to say they can't go out and do, like dominate Arkansas, but Arkansas is in a position that Alabama and Colorado were, were just outside the top 25, and BYU's had Similar some vibe. issues with those teams. Yeah, I I said when BYU got ranked third, I felt like BYU should be like 12 to. 16 range. So now BYU's in that. I think this is a perfect spot. And in what world is being ranked 13th bad in any way? It's not. Like, it's, not. it's great. This is a great spot. And Pepperdine's number 10. So BYU's got at least one top 10 What's team. Santa Clara? I'm Santa Clara's not ranked. Interesting. Santa Clara's had a little bit of a drop off. Okay. Yeah. Well, BYU's probably had BYU's that. got Pepperdine on the schedule <laughs> still as well. And Santa Clara will still be a quality game. How about this, Jerem? Yesterday, Baylor defensive back Mark Milton said the following when he was asked about BYU quarterback Jaron Hall. Um, he's an he's a extremely smart player. You know, he knows where he wants to put the ball and when he wants to put the ball, and, and he, doesn't, he doesn't, like, put it out there to get interceptions or anything, you know what I mean? He, he places it where he knows, you know, he'll get a catch, you know? He, he doesn't, you know, gamble with it too much, but he will throw the ball to number 12, and that's, we got something for that. All right, we've got something for that. What the heck does that mean? What is that something? What, what, um, what is the something that they have for that? So let's talk about it. So last year, BYU threw for 342 uh, and a touch from Jaron Hall, efficiency of 174. That's a really good statistical game. That's because BYU's behind uh, most of this game and they've got to throw to try and catch up, okay? BYU's got to establish the run. I, it was a monster passing game. BYU put up 24 points, not enough points for that many passing yards. Puka had an incredible game. Five for 168-2. BYU's got to be able to have Christopher Brooks and Lopini Katoa and Jaron Hall as he had that 50-yard run on fourth and one or whatnot, right? Got to have that um, 53. Got to have that in this game. It, it can't be a catch-up game again sure. against that really sure. good Baylor defense. Okay, well, expect double teams on Puka Nakua. I'm guessing sure. that's what it comes to. Expect, expect in him to be double team. Injury. Yeah, and expect a lot of cover two because Jaron Hall threw his interception into cover two. He's thrown a few of those with cover two defense, so I'd imagine we'll see a lot of that from Baylor. And we'll see some double teams so, with Puka Nakua. So look for nickel and diming down the field, as BYU does effectively, to its array of 12 different receivers that it threw to on Saturday. I don't care how BYU scores, just that it scores. It doesn't need to be explosive every time. Sometimes, yeah, sure. Can Puka Nakua still get down the field in this game? Yes. But uh, let, let's just see BYU put, get to the 30s. Baylor never gave up 31 points in a game last year. Like, their defense is good, and they still have Siasi Ika from Salt Lake City playing in front of the hometown crowd. Well, we got something for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Blake Freeland. Yep. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Resume building. Yes, I know we're smack dab early in the middle of the college football season, but we just got the BYU men's basketball schedule. Hot off the press. My question for you, Jeremy, is as we look at this, we're all wondering, okay, missed out on the NCAA tournament last year. How do the Cougars get back to the NCAA tournament? And are there enough games on this schedule that would yeah. help BYU make a tournament worthy resume. So does the non-conference schedule do enough, in your opinion, to build the at-large resume? Yeah, and we're not talking about the roster and how we think they'll perform against the schedule, just the schedule, to be clear. Yes, San Diego State, that's a great road game. I, I love that game. I'm not sure if I'll still love it uh, with the Big 12 schedule. Uh, we, may, we may get to the point where uh, yeah. <laughs> we're just like, hey, just win as many games in non-con as you can. But uh, the, the Missouri State game at home, that's a sneaky one because Missouri State was 72 in the net last year. So that, you're hoping that's quad two. Hoping it stays quad two, yes. Hoping, probably not, but we'll see. Uh, Battle for Atlantis is really good. USC, obviously a rematch from when BYU went to Uncasville, Connecticut 
uh, a couple of years ago. You were there. I was there. Weird, weird, uh, crazy place. Uh, Kansas, North Carolina State sitting there in that second round. If BYU beats USC, it would li- likely line up with Kansas. Great resume building game. If you can win that, amazing, right? Dayton, Wisconsin, Butler, Tennessee. Wisconsin, uh, 25th, Tennessee, 7th in the net. So there's a couple of games sitting there that really could be quad ones, quad twos. Butler was 117, a little bit of a surprise in the net. And then, of course, uh, Utah. Utah was 133 in the net. At home for BYU, that's going to be a quad three potentially. If Utah, here's the thing you want Utah to be good because then it helps your resume. And if you win that, it's great. But if Utah loses all 31 regular season games, that'd be fine with me. Um, I, there are enough. But it depends on uh, BYU's ability to go to San Diego State and do what it has done historically with the likes of Charles Abu and Abuo and Alex Barcelo and company, which is go to San Diego State and win that game. And then the battle for Atlantis, it's really important that BYU wins that first game. they got to get on that winner's side of the bracket, get a, get a win over USC, get a yeah. game with yeah. Kansas, just see what it's like, right? And then hopefully you get another game against ideally Wisconsin or Tennessee. And then it's enough because you know you got two quad ones with Gonzaga. You know you've got hopefully two with St. Mary's, at least, at least one on one. the road. And then last year, BYU had two quad ones with San Francisco Santa and had Santa Clara as well. Yes. I don't expect Santa Clara to be as good as they were. Jalen Williams went like 12th in the draft. Unbelievable. San Francisco, I don't expect them to be as good either. That was like a banner year. Bill Russell was like, that was amazing. Bill Cartwright, too, was at a ton of games. There are enough. Now, at a later date, we will discuss this BYU team and roster how they stack up against said schedule. But there are enough there, and the, the key to that whole thing is the MT, the multi-team event, the Battle for Atlantis. That is a good turn. That's the second best MT you can play in. Maui is number one. We've discussed eight quad one opportunities as like a decent mark for BYU to hit year in and year out with the schedule. We believe there are eight on this schedule. So as long as there are eight opportunities, and maybe BYU can string together three and five. Three and five is fine. That's, Three and that's five, good, like, again, yeah. basketball, you are rewarded for playing challenging teams. We and can if you get a few it. of those, yeah. you are double rewarded. Yeah. Like a three and five mark against eight quad one teams is tournament resume worthy. You only played 10 last year, Spencer, and went four and six. But went, had some terrible losses. Well, just one. No quad three losses, one quad four loss at Pacific. That one, ah, that one that hurt. hurts. Even it, without that one, I'm still not sure BYU makes a turn. It was. It was tough. That was a bad loss, though. Because San, Fr- uh, San Francisco ended up just squeezing out BYU's Sure. You're, I mean, you're, you finished fourth in the West Coast Conference. Like, and they, B- don't look at how many bid- they don't look at how many bids by league like that. They look at individual teams. But, yeah, that was tough. So, sh- certainly, I mean, BYU was a two seed in the NIT. They were bubblicious for, for sure. Uh, maybe take away that super bad loss. and Maybe one of their one of the first four out. Beat, still not in. Beat San Francisco in the West Coast Conference you had Tournament. To beat them. You had to beat them. Beat, beat them in the West Coast Conference Tournament. You have a quad one. BYU maybe sneaks in as like one of the last teams into the tournament. They didn't do it. They had opportunities. They just yes. didn't do it. Yes. Uh, we think three and five will be good enough. And then hopefully a top three finish in the West Coast Conference. And even third may not be enough. It's not about where you finish in the league, right? Okay, topic two. BYU jumps four spots in this week's AP poll, 25-21. Okay, if BYU beats the ninth-ranked Baylor, how high could the Cougars jump, in your opinion? Well, based on the logic that the AP voters used with unranked Florida at home beating a top-10 team in Gainesville in number 7 Utah, then BYU would essentially flip-flop almost. Florida didn't quite get to number 7. They got all the way up to number 12. But they were, again, outside of the poll. So I'm just just using that logic... BYU probably jumps up to 11 or 12 mm. after beating Baylor. Like that, that, and that is, I mean, a 10 spot jump. It's not crazy to think that that would happen because it's so early in the season. And now it's like, okay, BYU just beat the defending Big 12 champions, which, I mean, come on. Like, top five wins don't happen often, Jerem. Top, which, top 10. Top 10 wins, I should say, do mm. not happen often for BYU, which brings us to our stat of the day. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. BYU's got five wins all time against top ten teams when the game was played, right? Not end of the year, which we also talked about. So it's very rare. Five, twenty-two, and one. Okay, let's talk about the jumps BYU has made when these wins happen. Yeah, let's do it. Twenty eighteen against Wisconsin was like this massive outlier. Like that team was seven and six. BYU had just lost to Cal at home. <laughs> Nobody was giving BYU a what? chance to win in, in at Wisconsin. Yeah, BYU wins that game. They go from unranked to twenty fifth. So hard to know like where. 
BYU was ranked 20th when it beat third ranked Oklahoma in uh, 09. Jumped uh, 11 spots. Woo! Huge. When BYU beat Miami, it was ranked 16th. Everyone forgets that. They're like, oh, BYU had no shot. No, BYU had a shot. They were and it ranked, also wasn't the first game of the season. They were ranked 16th. Yeah. BYU's second game. BYU of the beat season. UTEP in, in week one. Yes. Uh, BYU jumped 11 in that one. Okay. Uh, okay. In, in 84, unranked to 13th, which it was a top 20 poll at the time, so at least eight spots. And then uh, in 85, BYU was ranked 16th when it beat uh, Air Force, who was ranked fourth, went up five spots. I don't think BYU cracks the top 10 if, if the Cougars win this I'd say game. 11. Yeah, I 11 think they're right five. outside of it Yep, somewhere. Um, but, yeah, like an eight or nine spot jump. Yeah, and then BYU goes into Eugene, should it accomplish uh, you know, that, a win against Baylor, with this big-time game. Here's the, th- here's the thing, dude. If BYU loses against Baylor, unranked, like, Instantly. And like, that, that, like, to, that to me feels un- a little bit unless silly. Unless it's like double OT and BYU Close. loses by a field goal or something, then maybe BYU holds on at like 23 or 25. 25. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But if, if, B, if let's say the same game happens last year, th- Saturday, BYU yes. loses by 14. Yeah, BYU's in ranked. But, but is this the most confident we've felt going into this kind of game ever? Yeah. I mean, Against you- a top 10 team where, where BYU – and you brought this up on our call this morning. When has BYU been favored yes. against a top 10 team? Like, this is very rare. Ever. This is incredible. Just think about the wins. Was BYU favored against Wisconsin? No. No way. Were they favored against Oklahoma? Heck no. Miami? Ha! That was the number one team in America. That was not going to happen. This Even is Air- unique. Maybe Air Force in Provo? Yeah, because BYU's defending national champs. They're ranked uh, 16th like, or whatever. Yeah. That kind of felt like a toss-up. I don't know what the line was. Were they making lines for those <laughs> games in 1985? Yeah, well, I was in diapers, so I have no idea. Yeah. No, BYU's never been clearly favored in a game like this, but here they are, three and a half point favorite in Provo. Dude, I saw one line that had BYU as like a while ago, like an eight point favorite. What? I was like, what? That's crazy. Yeah, I, this this line should be tight. That doesn't mean the game's going to be close. It just it just means, okay, going in, this is what we think is going to happen. This is a unique situation, and if BYU wins this game, it certainly is is keeping with what we said, which is. This could be a special season in BYU history. Oh, for sure. Play. If you can get 10 and 2 out of this, you got to beat Baylor to feel confident that 10 and 2 is possible. Yeah, if what, not, you go to 9 and 3. For wouldn't it be something if BYU, okay, let's say they beat Baylor, they're the number 11 team in the country going to Oregon when Oregon began as the number 11 team in the country. And now, like, Fox is, Fox is rooting for BYU this week. Oh, okay. absolutely. Let me tell you why. Even though they have a deal with the Big 12, it's because they don't want an unranked BYU rolling into Eugene. They want a, a top. 14 BYU against Oregon. Who's Oregon's gonna... one out, by the way. So if they maybe they're number 25. Maybe they sneak in. They have yeah. Like, yeah. Because they're like, whoa, Oregon's not what we thought they were. And neither is BYU. Like, yeah, come on. They don't want unranked Oregon versus BYU. BYU is searching for a matchup. sixth win all time against a top 10 program. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Jerem, I'm going to uh, I'm going to yield to you here for the first topic of the day. Because, yield, yes, yield. Yes, you're going. Like I'm super excited to discuss these numbers. You're, you're so a numbers excited. guy. You no, want to answer first. Here you're a go. numbers guy, and I do want to answer this first. I'm also a human being. Uh, <laughs> after seeing Week One's ESPN's Football Power Index, it, they adjusted their numbers. So let's break down Majorly. some of these numbers. See what we think. Notable changes include BYU now below 50% win probability in only two games, Notre Dame and this week against Baylor. Okay. The, uh, the Oregon game went from 26% to 52%. Excuse me. Arkansas up 12% from 46 to 58. So with this new information, and notably, uh, you know, Baylor, um, you know, it stayed the same. Notre Dame went up 9%. Um, have your season expectations changed based on these win probability increases? I want to say, yeah, BYU is for sure going to win 10 games in the regular season now, but I'm still at 9-3. and three. I feel mm-hmm. better about 9-3. and three. Yeah. I have I, that I, same I feel idea. Yep. Stronger I just feel better. about 9-3. and three. I'm feeling way better about the Boise State scenario. And it's oh, kind of, they were so bad. They turned yeah. it over a gajillion times. They pulled the greatest quarterback in college football history, according to Boise State, Hank Bachmeyer. They got lit up. They, they didn't. They the looked State? like a very mediocre, yeah. middling Mountain West Conference team. It was weird. Yeah, Oregon State's improved, but still. Uh, Oregon State, by the way, half one side of their stadium is being finished and renovated, so all the fans were on one half of the, yes. the other half. It was weird. 
This makes me feel better about BYU sweeping through the group of five opponents. Mm. Because we talked a few weeks ago about, ah, oh, there's typically just like one group of five loss in there. It's only happened a couple of times in the last couple of decades where BYU has gone undefeated against all their group of five opponents. Like, this is the opportunity. This year, with this team, as experienced as they are, if Boise State is down, and East Carolina might be better than we expected, they but they got to come to Provo. They should, yeah, they should have won that game. At Liberty is sneaky, but they don't have Malik Willis. 70% chance for BYU to win yeah. at Liberty. Now, that was like 51% when the season began. Yeah, that's the game we're really – who cares about that game? Right? No, so I, I feel um, better yeah. about BYU sweeping the group of five. So now I'm kind of like, uh, BYU like nine and a half wins. That's kind of how I feel. Where you're, yeah, le- leaning on maybe ten. Yes. It all depends, honestly, on Saturday. And we'll address this more as the week goes on. But I have a hard time feeling like, okay, if BYU loses this game Saturday, that 10-2 and two is pretty feasible. I think you got to win to keep that possibility. Because going. it's a home power five? It's a home power five. Baylor's really good. I think – it's hard to know. I, I think Notre Dame's the best team on the schedule right now, still, despite uh, – I thought they played pretty well against Ohio State. Sure. Ohio State's good. Some people would argue that Arkansas is even better than Baylor. That's the, that's the conversation in my mind, at least. I'm talking to myself, apparently. Baylor and Arkansas as the second best game. Got to win one of those. Those are going to be tough. Oregon is interesting, too, because Georgia would have crushed almost everybody. Like, there are only a handful of teams that would have given them a game in that scenario in Atlanta. Um, can you imagine, like – BYU coming off a natty playing someone in Salt Lake. Like, they would have just crushed a fool, you know? I'd like to think that BYU wouldn't lose by 46 to Georgia, oh, though. I would hope so. The, the goal for BYU at SEC teams on the road is just cross the 50. That's just <laughs> – well, let's start there. It hurts. <laughs> the 2017 it's LSU. But that was a bad BYU team, right? Th- this team is the exact opposite of that. So, I, I don't really change my expectations. Are we, should we feel good about – a 50-pointer on the road where BYU just dominates. Yes, special teams got astray, whatever. And some of the opponents performed poorly over the weekend. Some performed well. But, like, yeah, you look at Boise State and Oregon, you go, hmm, interesting. Those games feel more winnable. Granted, I don't want to overreact over one game. Like, Oregon's going to play an FCS team this week. I think Eastern Washington, they're going to crush them. And then BYU rolls in there. Oregon's Oregon's uh, lacking a little confidence. BYU hopefully beats Baylor and then comes in pretty confident. Now it's a big game. You're trying to avenge, what was it? Was it 90? I think it was 90 when BYU, or 91, when BYU went in there and and, uh, and lost. My mom didn't take me to that game either. Mom, you got to take me to these games. You got to take me to 84 when I'm a baby. You got to take me to this. <laughs> I never game. I, I could have helped. But, <laughs> but I'm, I'm excited about, uh, you know, what, what BYU has there. Obviously, Puka Nakua's health is something that matters. For this Saturday, because if Puka's in there, he saw how explosive he can be. I think BYU, I don't know that BYU needs him to win, but it certainly help, obviously. The crowd plays a huge factor, and I, I believe that's why Las Vegas says BYU's going to win this game by three points, maybe four points, because of what they saw the Cougars do at home last year outside of Boise State. They, they saw the energy early in the season. Man, if we, can, if we could just like compartmentalize or bottle up uh, some of the energy that existed from that Utah scenario and that home like a Russia. tear in Harry Potter with yes, memories, just, some, just, just something, put right? Put it in a bottle, something, right? And then BYU could like channel into that a, even half of the energy that was there against Utah last year. I think year. it'll be similar. Space. I like BYU's chances against Baylor. Home opener. It's a, it's a similar scenario. It's Same a Big kickoff game. time. Top, yep, top tip. Listen, we've become comfortable with that kickoff time. It t- it took us like ten years, but we've become like, hey, that's kind of our time, like. It, that, that's a late game for Baylor. That's a 9-20 uh, start time to their bodies, right? But they're in college. They stay up late. You know when it's not? You're not at your peak physical performance? Like in the third quarter when you're at altitude and it's late. You know what I mean? BYU's used to this stuff. Yes. Like South Florida was used to the uh, humid temperatures. Here's the thing with South Florida. They stink, so it didn't matter. But Baylor is really good. And if BYU, to me, this game comes down to can BYU establish the run? Because last year, Baylor said, Tyler Algier will not beat us. Puka and they, cool, al- mate. they allowed, well, didn't beat, didn't beat him. They, he, he had a ton of yards, 5 for 168, 2, but it didn't win the game. That was, that was the game plan. BYU's got to be able to run the rock. And then BYU's got to be able to stop the run. Certainly, that offensive line from Baylor's legit. That, to me, is the biggest thing. Stopping Baylor's Stop run. the run, you got a chance to win. Yeah. If BYU is like last year and gives up 309, no, no chance. No, no, no. No chance. But this BYU team's not giving up 300 yards. In fact, they need, they need to give up perhaps less than 200. In yeah, that, that, to me, is like the mark. If BYU can avoid just getting run over and stay with – like, if Baylor has held under 200 yards rushing, 
BYU has a great chance of winning this game. And then you're asking Blake Shapin, who has started, uh, I think, maybe one true road game. Now you got to beat us. Hey, welcome to one of the toughest places to play. Not only because of how good the team is and how great the crowd is, but again, altitude and yeah. quality. Like, it is, this is a tough, we've seen this before with Keaton Slovis uh, as a freshman at USC. Yes. With Jordan Love. Yes. Even at Utah State, like, BYU's drop eight zone. Jerem. And with the crowd, like, I'm excited about what BYU brings. Jerem, I'm about to make you feel way better about this game. I feel pretty good. Remind me what happened the last time a Baylor quarterback, to some degree, started against BYU early in the season. Last One, week? Charlie Brewer. Oh, for Brother Utah, Brewer. The former the man Baylor who, quarterback. The man who ended the streak, Smith. The guy who we heard all, I mean, we heard from everybody. Charlie Brewer. He threw for 10,000 yards of Baylor. Oh, he's so good. He just, He's just going to eat that BYU secondary alive. He was so good, he started over Cam Rising. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. And then he transferred like two weeks after he lost to BYU. And do you know where he is now? He's at Liberty. He's at Liberty. <laughs> BYU's going to like hand him like a gift basket and a wreath before the okay. game and be like, thanks for helping end the streak against Utah. Yeah. <laughs> Baylor quarterbacks coming to Pro Bowl early in the season. My stock's in the Cougars, Jerem. Let's I see. like it. I Gary like- Bohannon, check. Charlie Brewer, <laughs> check. Whoever the 84 star for Baylor was, check. check. Yes. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Until I see it, <laughs> we I'm discovered. not going to believe it. All right, Thomas. I like that energy. I like that no faith in you energy. <laughs> I, I, Blake Shapin, <laughs> prove BYU, prove me wrong. Okay. I, Shapin my heart into belief. <laughs> Still, FPI, for what it's worth, says BYU only has a 42% chance to win at home. They disagree. I'm fine with that against a top yeah, 10 team. Spin. Those metrics disagree with just the straight odds makers. Okay. But blind resume, okay, top 10 teams coming to Provo. BYU has a 42% chance to win. I love that. I love Come that. Come on. That's great. That's really solid. That's really solid. All right. Big game. The best of BYU Sports Nation. We'll be right back. Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. What's different this time around for BYU football as they now host the ninth-ranked Baylor Bears in Provo, Utah? BYU ran into a buzzsaw in Waco last year. A late touchdown made the final score a little bit more respectable, but let's face it, BYU got run over by the Baylor Bears, Abram Smith, and that huge offensive line. He became Abraham in that game. The Cougars are now, depending on which expert you talk to and which line you look at, somewhere between a three-and-a-half and four-and-a-half four point favorite, Jerem. Wow. This is very interesting because they are ranked 12 spots lower than Baylor. Yes, the game is in Provo, but the defending Big 12 champs are coming to town. So that got us thinking, okay, what is so different about this year other than location for BYU and Baylor that the Cougars are now a four-and-a-half point favorite after losing by 14 on the road last year? Let's discuss, Jerem. What will be different this year in the BYU-Baylor game? Three things, Spence. Maybe four. One, BYU will be able to run the ball better. The Cougars only ran for 67 yards total last year. Most of that came on Jaron Hall's fourth down touchdown run. Yeah, weird. With Ty- like Tyler Algier's game, like his with worst Tyler- game. With Tyler Algier on the team in a record-setting season. I believe BYU goes for 150-plus. I do. I think the O-line has improved. I really like BYU's diversity of attack with Chris Brooks and Lopini Katoa. I think we'll see Jaron Hall in the run game a little more than we saw last week. That's number one. Number two, BYU won't be playing from behind most of the game. The Cougars had a lead in this game last year, but uh, after that had to throw the ball quite a bit. It changes play calling, and Baylor ran 20 more plays than BYU. The Cougars could not get off the field. I believe they'll be uh, just fine in that regard. Number three, Dylan Doyle, linebacker for Baylor, will not have a record-setting game like he had last year, which was a linebacker having a receiving, rushing, TD, and a sack in the same game. That was wild. First time in Baylor history. That will not happen. And four, I believe BYU will win the game. I think this will be one of the all-time wins in BYU history in terms of beating a top 10. I think BYU wins this game. I think it's close. As I tweeted out yesterday after our conversation after the show, because we have that, the show continues, just not on the air, that BYU will win the game. And if they do, it's by one score. All five top yes. 10 wins have been by one score. Okay, so this will happen. Those are the four differences to me. All right. Uh, I'm going to throw out the fact that, yes, obviously the location is different. 
the atmosphere is going to be very, very different for BYU in the late game. And some people say it doesn't matter when you play. If you're a better team, you just show up and you play. I think it does matter. I think, I think a night game in Lavelle Edwards Stadium in a season opener is an advantage for BYU, significant advantage. Uh, I don't know how much. Hard Significant. To, hard to quantify in points, um, but I'd probably give BYU like a three or four point edge just based on the fact that it's late. It's the home opener wow. under the lights at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Okay. okay? So that, that alone will make things at least a little bit different for BYU. I'm with you. I feel like the offensive line for BYU will get a much better push against a good Baylor defensive front. I mean – Baylor brings back a ton of guys. They're very capable. I think BYU's offensive line is better than they were last year. And they'll feed off of the emotion of the crowd. And BYU's not going to have a scenario where the, the lead back rushes for 34 yards on 15 carries. Like, that's not going to happen. That's, that's how tough it was for Tyler Algier last year. He was averaging essentially two yards a carry. Like, when did that ever happen in Tyler Algier's career? It did it. Very rare. That will be very different. Whether it's Lopini Katoa, it's Chris Brooks, BYU will have a much more impactful uh, scenario with the running game. And here's why. Because I think they're so focused on Puka Nakua. Clearly. They, I mean, they're talking about him specifically. Number 12, yeah, Jaron Hall threw it up to him. He can catch it. We got something for that. Okay. If they're going to drop a little bit more pass coverage down, then there are going to be more opportunities for BYU to run the ball. So that's why, uh, coupled with BYU's offensive line being better, and Baylor now focused so much, which is why I think Puka Nuku is going to play. He's going to play. Even if BYU, if he's not 100%, he can be used as a very significant decoy. Absolutely. Okay, to distract Baylor. So I feel like that will certainly be different and open up the rush game. Also, BYU is not going to give up over 300 yards rushing on the defensive front. That's not going to That's happen. Not Abram going to happen, Smith yeah. is not walking through the door for Baylor, yep. nor any running back or scenario capable of making that happen on the road. Tristan Ebner was tremendous as well. Had, had Great uh, player. Yeah, he got drafted, another one of their running Great backs. player. Abram Smith didn't even get drafted. Yeah, here, here's the thing that's different for Baylor as well that we should mention. Uh, Blake Shapin is, uh, is a better quarterback than Gary Bohannon. Yes. And he is efficient. This guy was the number one shortstop prospect coming out of Louisiana, had committed to Arizona State to play football, decommitted, goes to Baylor. They put him in at the end of the year when they played some huge games against like Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, uh, uh, Big 12 championship game notably, uh, Sugar Bowl notably. So he's a good player. That is a difference too is Gary Bohannon didn't have to beat BYU last year, and he didn't last week either at South Florida. Shape and changes what they can do on offense yes. a little bit more. So that is one thing I am very and keenly aware of, but I, I really like where the secondary is at. I think BYU is ready for this moment because last year's team was tremendous, fizzled out in the bowl game, unfortunately, didn't really pop in the preseason polls. This is a chance to really show on ESPN, late night game, top 10 opponent. Yeah. BYU has a chance in this game to cement itself, its legacy as a team Early in the season, there's a lot of football to be played to elevate or, or de-escalate right from that moment. But if BYU wins this game, it's just the sixth top ten game uh, you've ever Wild. won. Wild. And it's uh, the home opener. And it's the only Big 12 game the year before. And it's after last year getting run over by Baylor. So I think this team has circled this mentally, whether they'll say it out loud or not. And that they will be ready, and that they will play well. Listen, th this is going to be. Th there's going to be Utah, Arizona State, and even USC 2019 vibes here. What I mean by that is, don't look at the box score and assume that everything needs to be clean and easy and nice for yes. BYU to win. This is going to be a game where BYU may not throw for 250. They may not rush for, uh, you know, 200 or whatever. It's going to be a take care of the ball game. Get some some hard, dirty yards late in the game when it's physical and, and weird. And just win. Like, I do not care most games how BYU wins. And this is one of those. Like, last week it was like, mm, you got to win, I think, convincingly to really feel good about the, sure. the win, the sure. game. South Florida, you're an 11.5 point favorite. This game, just win, baby, because it's a top 10 team. They are the Big 12 champs. They are the preseason pick to win. They beat you up last year. Defend Lavelle Edwards Stadium. All right, Jerem, li listen to this. Okay, Blake Shapin, has he played in an environment like Lavelle Edwards no. Stadium? Not even close. No, Ole Miss in the Sugar Bowl, certainly more of a challenge, but not like this. Great. Not a true road. Not yet. Yeah, neutral game. Okay. More big, of a challenge compared to. Big game for sure. Big game for sure, but yeah. not a hostile 
road environment. Yeah. He's played at Kansas State. Kansas State, Manhattan, is not Provo. Home opener, two ranked teams in Provo with 63,000 plus going bonkers. Man, it's not even the best Manhattan. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is his first true Little Manhattan. road test. Yep. Okay. We'll, we'll see, see how he we'll see how he shapes up. Uh, see what you did there, Anchor jokes. Boy. Uh, <laughs> anchor Dad. Topic two. Brett Yormark, new Big 12 commissioner, continues his tour day new Big 12. They visit to Provo Saturday. Check him out on BYOS and Game Day, by the way. Yes. At 8 Eastern. He was at uh, Cincinnati recently and asked about conference expansion, what schools would be good additions. He said this. Well, I don't want to get into specifics, and I appreciate the question, but obviously going out west is where I would like to go. Entering that fourth time zone, program that has national recognition, one that competes at the highest level in basketball and football, stands for the right things, is a good cultural fit. Because our alignment right now and the like-mindedness of all of our member institutions is fantastic, it's never been better. So I don't want to compromise that, and it's critically important that there's the right cultural fit when you think about coming in and being part of what we're building here. End mm, quote. Mm, Brett, your okay. mark. Okay. I just like him. Uh, what school do you think he's talking about? <laughs> that, that naturally was the first question I asked. Okay, I'm reading this. I'm like, okay, he clearly has a school, maybe two in mind, like available, power five level. Like, yes. And, op- why is, and why is it not Utah? The options are very small. <laughs> not on the West Coast. Like, Utah doesn't open up that fourth time zone. I'm just zone, trying to bring Utah in. Right? Yeah. Utah doesn't open the fourth time zone. Correct. So clearly he's thinking about a West Coast school. Mm-hmm. Oregon is the first one that floats to the top. First one that came to my mind. Good as well. in football and basketball. Yep. Okay. Nice you tradition. You like Blue Man basketball last year. Cultural fit. Okay. So Oregon to me is the school that he is explaining, and then may, depending on what time of year it is, because Arizona has their own time zone scenario. <laughs> right. Right. So sometimes Arizona show. Sometimes Arizona is like. An hour behind with Pacific time. My I mean, mom lives in Arizona. I never know what time it is. Yeah, it's weird. I have no idea if it's the same time as Mountain. They don't have not. daylight savings, so maybe right. Arizona has it right. They okay. also have weird paper size. That's another thing. Okay, conversation for another day. Does Arizona have it right and the rest of the United States doesn't with time zones? Maybe maybe he's talking about the Arizona schools, assuming that they're He said football in, and basketball. That's true. Is there, is, Arizona State doesn't really qualify no. for that either. no. It's Oregon. I want to say Stanford, but is Stanford the right cultural fit for the Big 12? That, no, that's a very different um, political it's mindset. Or, it's Oregon, and depending on what time of day well, it is in Arizona, maybe the Arizona schools. Well, and, and Oregon, it's Portland is liberal. The rest of the state is not, so that's interesting. Washington could come to mind as well, a team that competes well. But I think it's clearly Oregon, which he was talking about. Oregon is eyeing the Big Ten for obvious reasons. And so is Washington, trying to hitch their wagon yeah, to Oregon. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's interesting. He's, he's being very aggressive. This is a businessman who has entered the college sports game at a higher level now as a commissioner of the Big 12. And this is our guy, man. Listen, BYU hasn't always uh, felt like the commission was their guy. They felt like Carl Benson was their guy. They did not feel like Craig Thompson was their guy in the Mountain West. Um, and, and here comes Brett Yormark, just uh, guns a blazing. Um, open open for, for, business. for business, right? So we'll we'll see what this means um, if BYU actually, uh, excuse me, the Big Twelve actually expands or not. But I thought this would kind of like go away. But he was asked, so he answered. Um, he didn't just bring it up. Yeah. So we'll we'll see where we go. I thought once we got into season, it'd just be like tabled till later. Yeah. No, no, no. The playoff expanded in season now between week zero and one. We're still having this conversation. This is this is a big deal. He. He's on the forefront of this, which is what I want as a now fan of the Big 12, of, okay, if there's going to be a move made, it's not going to be for a lack of aggression or preparation or foresight on, on behalf of the league. Intriguing stuff developing, as uh, we said earlier, Brett Yormach <laughs> and the Big 12 are open for business. Puddles, come hang out, man. Uh, some, I can hear a San Diego State fan saying, what about San Diego State? No, no. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Hear are what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. About time we discussed, like, probably the most dominant program on BYU's campus over the last Eight to ten years. Highest ranked team right now. Right. Right? I mean, that consistently, like, elite. Yeah. Everyone's like, what sport are we talking about? Unless you watch the previous bump, 
where we set it. It is men's and women's cross country, specifically yeah. the men's cross country team right. today with All American Casey Klinger. Casey, welcome up, Casey? to BYU Sports Nation. Thanks, thanks for having me. Have right. we we've had you on once, maybe? First um, time. First time. Yeah. What? First time. Welcome yeah. to the show, man. Great thanks. to have you. Good For whatever reason, I was thinking we had you on in the COVID era, maybe over Zoom, but okay. Wow, first time. Yeah. Welcome to the studio, man. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I just asked a question before we went to break. We're talking about rankings and underrated and overrated. Is the men's cross country team underrated at BYU currently? Currently? Like, I don't know. I think, I mean, people know we're good, especially at BYU. Like, they, like if they know the sport, they know we're good. Um, nationally, I think we're in a good spot just to, because we can just go up from here. So, I mean. Do you like it? Do you like where you are? I, we like where we are right now. Okay. Yeah, we're happy with it. I love that there's a uh, rivalry with Northern Arizona as well. I yeah. just think it's fun. Like, because you'd think, hey, we're both running. You know, it's, it's, it's a unique sport in that you both kind of do your thing and hopefully right. I'll be ahead of you. But no, no, no. It's like a thing. It's a thing. With NAU. Yeah, it's a thing. How does that manifest itself when you're racing? Um, I mean, obviously, we're super competitive guys, and so you see a guy in a yellow singlet from NAU, and you just want to, <laughs> yeah, you just want to beat him. <laughs> Do you feel that about anybody else, or is it just Northern Arizona? Um, I mean, it's like we because of the rivalry. Like, if you see that yellow singlet, like you're gunning for them. But also, like when you're in the front portion of the race, you kind of just want to beat anyone. So uh, it's a little bit of both, but it's definitely a special rivalry. I love that between us for sure. How are you a senior now? I feel like you just got here. Um, are you? Do you have? Are you like a junior <laughs> in track? Yeah, I'm a junior eligibility wise. Okay, so that's fantastic. You just listed that. as a senior. You have two years. Yeah, I have two years. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, I, I've awesome. been here since 2017. Actually, I was gonna say <laughs> you, you you graduate high school and you're the Gatorade National Runner of the Year, which is incredible cross country. Going to mission to Japan. Um, you've been uh, top 10 and 13 of 15 uh, races in your career. Awesome. Three-time All-American. Like, what's the next step for you in your evolution as a runner? Um, that's a good question. I just, I've always wanted to just be better every year. Um, it's been a very, like, gradual progression for me, and I've been managed to uh, improve every year, sometimes not as much as I wanted. But um, as long as I'm improving every year, I've been happy. And so this year is obviously... I want to be, you know, a title contender. I want to be in the mix. I want to, you know, try to keep that BYU streak alive. So, hey, that'd be awesome, especially with Connor winning the yes. uh, obviously back to back right. national championships and the 20K yesterday, which is pretty cool That's as awesome. well. Yeah. yeah, Jeremy was just hanging out with Connor at uh, the Killers concert a few days yeah, ago. Yeah, next time you oh, come yeah? too. Yeah, yeah, You'd, sick invite. Yeah, it was, yeah. Next, <laughs> ne next time we'll bring it. What did you learn from Connor Mance? Um, I learned a lot of things from Connor Mance. I learned how to like. He's one of the most dedicated runners I've ever known. Like he's just so dedicated to the sport and to the team. And so he taught me a lot of good habits um, on how to be a successful runner. Okay, the Cowboy Jamboree is coming up in a couple of weeks. That's on the same course as the NCAA championships, right? Correct. What will that race mean in terms of sort of, okay, here's where it's going to be. Here's where we need to finish. Right. Um, it's always good to go check out the course before nationals. And so mainly it's just – to go out there and get some exposure on the course. Um, a few of us have, are returners, so we've run there before because we ran back in March 2021 at that course. So, But we have a lot of awesome new guys that it's going to be good to show them that course, get a feel for it, so we can come back really strong at Nationals. And I should clarify, Stillwater, Oklahoma. Stillwater. Oklahoma State, that's where it's at. Yep. All right, three-time All-American Casey Klinger of BYU Men's Cross Country is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Where do you feel like you need to be better specifically? Because, I mean, we're talking about, like, trying to trim up seconds and, like, just little, little things. Like, where do you feel like you need to be and will be better this year? Um, this year, my personal mantra, like, has been be tough. Um, I mean, cross country is all about who's the toughest. And so um, no matter how tough you are, you get out on the course and you realize you can be tougher. So... Um, this year is just to be try to be the toughest guy on the course um, and, yeah, just run through the pain. It's one of the two OG sports. <laughs> one is boxing. You're just fighting for your survival. Okay. And the other is running from, like, animals and stuff. Like, the original humans, <laughs> this was part of it, right? You just got to be tough. Okay, you're, you're uh, married to Morgan Bauer, one of the three sisters on the team, Whitney right. and Eden. Tell us about the Bowers because they're an incredible family. We've gotten to know them over the years. 
Can you play volleyball? <laughs> <laughs> so my, I grew up around the sport. My two older brothers played volleyball at UVU nice. at their club. So I kind of grew up watching tournaments in the like gym. Like you can pepper and stuff? I, I can pepper. Can hold your <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I, like, I, I actually played a grass tournament with Morgan two summers ago. Oh, very nice. Yeah, so. Oh, you can play then. I, I was definitely the weak link, but <laughs> I, I held my own. Okay. But, um, and yeah, right so, now, you're better than a few of her younger sisters. No. <laughs> False. They're all better. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. I can I love, actually, yeah, they're all Kat's better. Kat's <laughs> the youngest, and she's 10, and she can whip it, dude. Oh, she's, I, wow. I've seen it in person. She's good. She's yeah, really good. She's really good. She plays at, like, five years up, I think. Yes. Wow. Yeah. wow. So, I mean, clearly, so the Bowers get started early. I mean, did yeah. you do the same with cross country? I mean, um, were, were you thrown into the sport when you were, like, five years old, and you are like, Casey, run <laughs> fast. You know, I was like, run a 5 No parent would do that to their kid. <laughs> uh, it's I grew up playing soccer, so... I do like the right. the Pleasant Grove Strawberry Days 5K every year. Oh, like when I was so good. starting from when I was like 12. But okay, so yeah, when did you realize I'm pretty good at this? When I started those, yeah, it was like oh, like I'm decent at running, but I just stuck with soccer because all my friends played and I liked soccer. Um, and then you know, getting up into high school, I just kind of made the transition out of soccer into running. So tell us something about the Bowers we don't know. So the Bowers, I, I don't know. I mean they. I feel like you guys know a lot about the Bowers. <laughs> I want to know more. Ultra competitive. <laughs> I want to know more. Yes. Um, well, they taught me how to hunt. Yeah. yeah. Big and they time do, They do love to yeah. hunt. Fishing, yeah. hunting, like turkey calling. I mean, the, yeah. first, the first time I met her dad was in a goose pit. <laughs> <laughs> what is a goose pit? It's a pit in a, the ground in a cornfield, <laughs> and you're just like sitting there with a shotgun. Waiting for, waiting the... for geese to come eat the corn. That's where you met Danny Bauer, three-point yes. specialist. That's, that's scary. Yeah, I think your daughter's long. great. I'm sorry. What? Yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. I would like to marry you. To, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> got a, the man's got a shotgun in right. your meeting. <laughs> Seriously. Your future I met... brother uh, with a shotgun in hand. Yeah. That literally happened, but it wasn't on a, a porch. <laughs> yeah, it was. That's hilarious. And I mean, he's he's a good dude. He's I mean, great. Yeah, he's I awesome. love Danny. So, <laughs> but yeah, they're all they yeah they taught me how to hunt. We go fishing. Like they're. They're awesome. That's awesome. cool. Yeah. That's hey, let's cool. give you some BYU Sports Nation karma. Yeah, for good luck. On the show, man. Good luck with everything. You're already Great awesome. Time You're a three-time All-American. This will give you just a little bit of edge. Be tougher on the course. Be tough. Let's Take go. Take the karma run low. Thanks for coming in, Casey. Thanks. Appreciate it. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. We need to talk about the Cougars after what they did in their season opening performance, and who better to do that with than ESPN College Football Insider and expert Trevor Maddich. It's another Maddich Monday. Trevor, happy Labor Day. Welcome back to now mid-football season. We're officially a week in. We are a weekend, and what an opening weekend. I mean, we learned a bunch of stuff. We had some of the most amazing, entertaining games in this opening weekend, and I think this is the greatest week one that I've ever seen. Mm. Uh, really? Why, why do you say that? What makes you say that? Well, look at the ACC, for example. North Carolina and North Carolina State were, were in desperate victories that they could have lost on one play multiple times. You've got Ohio State whose defense showed what they needed to show. Ohio State's defense for the last several years has squandered some of the best offenses in their history. And it's not because of talent or effort. It's because they have gotten sloppy in the basic fundamentals of stand in the right place, look at the right guy, and attack. And last year they kept on opening doors by being in the wrong spot, and guys didn't have to be blocked out of the way. Against Notre Dame, they tightened that up, especially in the second half. And there was nowhere for Notre Dame to run at that point. And that's what Ohio State needs in order to be able to complement their great offense and challenge for a national championship. So these are all things that we have good indications of in week one. Yeah, touche. So many great games, great finishes. Utah and Florida was epic. LSU yeah. and Florida State you brought was that one up unbelievable. I mean, just <laughs> so many great finishes to games in the opening weekend of college football. Trevor, I do want to focus on BYU, obviously, here after putting up 50 points in their season opener. I think we can put to bed the curse of Florida – and going two time zones to open the season and the humidity. Yeah, play like crappy teams in Florida. BYU showed up. <laughs> they looked great. In your opinion, where did they exceed expectations? I thought in big plays, especially in the running game. And that's good and that's bad. You know, they, they ran for over 300 yards against an improved 
USF defense. They brought in some uh, transfers, especially on the defensive line, that should have really elevated that defense. And BYU just just went through them uh, like like a hot knife through pate. That's a nod to Oregon and Georgia. Sorry about that. <laughs> the, uh, but I, I think that that was an important thing. Uh, one thing, though, you've got to watch out for is that about half of those 300 yards came on three plays, 75 of them by a wide receiver, not a running back. So BYU fans, I think, need to understand that that everything's a work in progress. And as well as they did against USF, that running game was dominant. A lot of young receivers got to step up because of injuries to the top two guys. They did well. I think that's a good start. And now against Baylor, everything gets a whole lot more difficult. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Puka Nakua, just incredible. Before he injures his ankle, hopefully he's all right and, and good against Florida. Christopher Brooks expected to be uh, the replacement for Tyler Algier. I don't know what the consensus is on him, but it feels like we think he can be like at least 75% of what Tyler was last year, right? And Chris is a very good player of his own right. 13 for 135 and a touch, notably two rushes of 40-plus in this game. What did you think of his performance with that offensive line? He looked powerful, didn't he? I mean, he looked solid when defenders were trying to tackle him. It was like he would just shrug him off. And, and that's a good thing because that's what Tyler Algier brought. He brought that that physicality and that ability to just bound people and wear them down. And Christopher Brooks showed that kind of capability. You know, the the I don't know how, how long he can keep that up. Let's hope he can. I like to see him catch a few more balls because that's one thing that Tyler brought to it. You never knew if he was going to have his touch by a handoff or a pitch or a throw down the field. And so I'd like to see a little bit more of that from Chris Brooks. But at the same time, I think the the – First game as a BYU Cougar was incredibly encouraging. Trevor Maddish, ESPN with us on BYU Sports Nation. Trevor, where is your biggest concern for BYU lying in uh, the Baylor game ahead and, and after what you saw from them in Florida as they push forward to their home opener? Well, special teams, coverage units, for goodness sake. Uh, for goodness sake, they gave up a kickoff return for a touchdown. Then a little bit later, they gave up a long kickoff return and tacked on a personal foul penalty that gave USF a short field to score a touchdown. That That's two of their three touchdowns uh, right there. And so that was a big deal. And so the coverage units are going to have to step up. That's huge. Another thing I think is that that the young receivers, as well as they did against USF, are going to be covered a lot more tightly against Baylor. Although I will say this, that if there's any question that Baylor has coming into the season, it probably is with a secondary because they lost so much talent in the back end off of last year's team. And so the the health situation of Pukunaku and Gunnar Romney is going to be critical. And the young guys that have to step up and play, regardless of whether those two guys play, are going to have to play at a high level because they have an opportunity to create an advantage against Baylor. And whether or not they can do that might be the key to this whole game. It feels like 1983-84 here with Baylor, where in 83 they won, in 84 BYU won, home fields there. That's the hope for BYU fans, certainly, in the home opener and a confident team that returns a lot of pieces back. How do you see these two teams matching up Saturday in a top 25 showdown? It's going to be much more of a fair fight than I think it was last year. Last year, by the time that game occurred, BYU's defensive front seven, especially, we just ran out of people. And there were a lot of guys playing as starters and in significant roles on the BYU front seven last year against Baylor that weren't expected to have such big roles. And then the depth was also weakened because the guys that were the depth had to step up and play in significant roles. But that helps this year because you've got more guys now with experience that they ordinarily wouldn't have had. And that's going to be critical because BYU, according to Pro Football Focus, came into this season with the number six offensive line in all of college football. But they also ranked Baylor as the number four offensive line in all of college football. And even though Baylor lost their top two rushers, they still have a good stable of running backs to run behind that line. So to me, the, the most critical matchup, other than BYU's receivers against the secondary of Baylor's defense, excuse me, BYU's a wide receiver against the secondary, the critical matchup is going to be the front seven of BYU. Being healthy now, relative to what they were last year, will they be able to stop this or at least slow down this Baylor rushing attack? Because if they can do that, a lot of other good things will happen. 
It's a Maddox Monday with ESPN's Trevor Maddox on BYU Sports Nation. Trevor, is there anything you learned about BYU that you felt like you weren't sure on after one week? Uh, no, no. They, they performed kind of as expected. I mean, I, I thought that that what happened would happen. You know, I thought that the running game and Chris Brooks, especially, and Katoa did a really good job. And I think that's important. I mean, th those things are are things that we expected coming into the season. So this game against South Florida, which was more tricky than people really realized um, going into it, I think they performed at a high enough level in all the ways that they needed to perform, except for that kickoff coverage, that you can say that BYU didn't surprise in any negative way. And I don't think that they could have surprised in a positive way in this game it only could have been a negative surprise, and they didn't do that. They, they, for the most part, were steady and solid as expected. Jaron Hall goes 25 of 32, 261, two touchdowns. Did throw an interception in the red zone, in the end zone. But uh, that was also South Florida could just snap it over the puncher's head, and BYU got the ball back. That was a heady move by Jaron just to reset there for two extra points. But what did you think of his performance in game one? I thought he was steady. He was solid. It wasn't particularly awesome, but it didn't need to be. What he needed to do was manage the tools around him, and he did. I think in this game, he'll need to be against Baylor. He'll need to be a bigger playmaker. But overall, he's getting he's getting a lot of buzz as one of those quarterbacks in that next tier that people aren't talking enough about. And this game against Baylor is going to give him an opportunity uh, to showcase that. Now, against USF, was he spectacular? Nope. But did he do what a BYU quarterback needs to do in this kind of a situation? The answer to that is yes. And I think people talk about being a game manager is a negative thing. And that's not negative. It's a good thing. If you can manage the game, that means that you're getting the most out of the players around you and the situations around you. And I thought that he did that in this game for the most part. Yeah, and uh, we should note that he's a drop pass by Keanu Hill away from going over 300 yards down the sideline, right? And his rating was 161. Um, Trevor, I did want to follow up on that. Do you feel like he managed the game despite 25 completions and the pass rating of 160 plus? I feel like it was more than that. Yeah, it seemed like there there would have been more than that. His QBR was 84, which is good. QBR quarterback rating is not just his rating as a passer, but it brings into it running and situations. So when you do what you do, and if the situation is critical, if it's a third down and it's third and 20 and you throw it for 10 yards, your passer rating goes up, but your QBR goes down, that kind of a thing. This QBR uh, was 84 out of 50 is average. 100 is maximum. So according to that, he was incredibly steady and didn't just play winning football, but he played outstanding football, according to the steadiness as indicated by the QBR rating. A few big picture questions for you now, Trevor. Uh, lost in kind of the shadow of the actual games over the weekend, was this little bit of news that the college football playoff is expanding to 12 teams. Hello. What? <laughs> like All of a sudden it was off the table, then it was back on, now it's apparently happening starting in 2026. What do you think of the decision to expand to a 12-team playoff? This is wonderful. I mean, wonderful. The And there's two reasons. One is that it, it restores the importance of conference championship races. In this 14 playoff, conference championships are a tiebreaker to be applied at the end of the process if they have to split hairs because they couldn't differentiate teams by other means. To me, that diminishes the value of conference championships. Now what you've got is the top six conference champions have an automatic berth. There's five power five conferences. That means a group of five conference champion is going to make it, and maybe more than one, depending on the ranking of a power five conference champion. So those championship races are restored for their importance. You could lose a couple of games early because maybe you've got some injuries or a new quarterback or a new coach or something, and then you can come back and win your conference and still have a chance to make that playoff. That's important. Plus, the top four ranked conference champions, are they get a bye. And so not the top four ranked teams, the four ranked conference champions get a buy. And to me, that, that also restores the value of conference championship races. The other thing is that it tells us that it doesn't look like we're going to have uh, another top tier forming in college football anytime mm -hmm. soon. The, my big worry was that the SEC and the Big Ten, with all this conference expansion, would add a few more teams and then make their own division, have their own playoff to the exclusion of everybody else. But the fact that they now have all agreed on this 12-team playoff with gives access to everybody tells me that they are likely 
to, well, they're, they're unlikely, if not absolutely not going to make that upper tier division for the foreseeable future. So for the stability of the future of college football with all the conference realignment and all those things, this, I think, adds a level of concrete stability that says that everything's going to slow down now and nothing massive is going to change beyond some scheduling and the conference logo sewn onto the jerseys of a few teams. And BYU will have that Big 12 logo proudly on its jersey next year. Now they know in a couple of years when this expands to 12, K okay, proudly – you have to have zero or one losses, probably, to uh, sneak into that. Perhaps two, but probably not. Okay, let's finish with this. Uh, some notable names on BYU schedules had some big wins, but several had notable losses, namely Oregon and Notre Dame and Boise State. I guess which one of these opponents uh, surprised you in a loss the most? I think Boise State. Oregon State is an underrated team. People don't understand how physical Oregon State has become. They're a tough out now. And so it's no, it's no, you know, it, it, it's not embarrassing to lose to Oregon State, but they lost by a lot. They got dominated by Oregon State, and that surprises me for a Boise State program that normally doesn't get dominated that way. And so that surprised me. Oregon getting obliterated surprised me a lot because Oregon came into the season with one of the best combinations of offensive line and defensive front seven, D-line and linebackers, in all of college football. And I thought that would be enough for them to have a fair fight in the trenches and keep this thing relatively close. And they didn't do that on both sides of the line of scrimmage. Georgia just dominated them. And so that tells us two things. It tells us that, that Georgia is probably back and probably underrated. But it also says that maybe Oregon is as good as we thought in those trenches, and they're not able to overcome that with skill position play, at least not yet. So, you know, for BYU fans, you know, you can't take too much away from week one, and Georgia is the defending national champions. But that game against Oregon now looks a lot more winnable than it did before yesterday or before Saturday's games. Trevor, we'll finish with this. Who was the most impressive team that you saw after week one? The most impressive team was Georgia. For that very reason, I mean, the defense lost five first-round draft choices off of last year's team. And they won't be better on defense, maybe not even quite as good, but they still will be one of the best defenses in the country. Jalen Carter on the defensive line might end up being the best defensive player in all of college football and be that next top 10 draft pick off of that defensive line. So that defense looks like it's reloaded. The offense, though, with Stetson Bennett at quarterback, has shown that it is a playmaking offense, not just a complementary offense to their great defense. Stetson Bennett gets a, a bad rap because he doesn't look like a big, powerful quarterback in his uniform, you know? So people think he's just a game manager along for the ride. But when you watch his games, he makes plays. I mean, there are times when he'll drop a cape and have everything break down and run around. He'll break tackles. He'll avoid tackles. And then he'll make a, a touchdown throw. In, th in ways that you would think only Bryce Young could do. Now, I'm not saying he's Bryce Young, but I'm saying that he has picked up from where he left off last year from a standpoint of not just managing the game, but from a standpoint of making plays when he, ha he has to be the playmaker. And I think Georgia against that Oregon team, which I do think is very good, I, I think that overall Georgia is underrated right now if you rank them at number three. Trevor, you have also reloaded with knowledge and are number one in our power rankings of analysts after week the number, number one. one. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> ESPN's Trevor Maddich with us on BYU Sports Nation. That's Bringing it. Join the conversation 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Earlier this week, BYU Offensive Coordinator Aaron Roderick was asked about Christopher Brooks and what is next for him after Game 1. Probably next step is just more carries, you know, showing that you can carry the load, you know, 20 times. And that's, you know, you have to get 13 in the game. And I would envision there's going to be games this year where he's in the 20s, and um, and uh, that's you know the great backs like Tyler last year got stronger as the game went on. The, the farther into the 20s he got in his carries, the stronger he got, and um, I'm, you know that remains to be seen about Chris. But I, I have a lot of confidence in him. 
Will Christopher Brooks have 20 plus carries against Baylor? No, but it'll be close. He's not going to get to the 20 mark tomorrow against Baylor. I think there are just too many different nuanced things and special sets and packages that Aaron Roderick did not show against South Florida that are going to be rolled out. Uh, I think BYU is certainly going to spread the ball around. I just don't think it's 20 plus carries for Brooks tomorrow. I think they'll utilize uh, Lopini Gatol a little bit more. Maybe Jaron Hall runs a little bit more. So he'll get there, but not tomorrow. I'll say yes. I'll say yes. He gets 20 Ooh. on the nose. Okay. There seems to be a push of sorts to make this Baylor-BYU matchup a rivalry. Is it a rivalry? I think that's Board Reporters midweek, uh, just trying to <laughs> scratch something out. Um, it's like a volcano, rivalries are. They just happen. You don't like summon a volcano. But, uh, their connections is certainly tipped towards that. Uh, Grimes and Mateos, of course, were at BYU. Uh, they're, the friendly neighbor thing I mentioned, uh, uh, we just moved into the Big 12 neighborhood, kind of, right? Or we said we're building in the Big 12 neighborhood, if you will. You need some vitriol to really have a rivalry. Yes. And that hasn't happened with Baylor. Perhaps down the road it will, but it's all uh, rainbows and sunshine right now with Baylor. No, I, there's more of a rivalry, honestly, with Texas. Um, because of what BYU has done Doesn't to Texas. did Texas have to beat BYU recently? Yes, yes, but I said, like, my point it's is, been 11 like, years. Like, my point is, BYU Baylor is not a rivalry. Like, no, like, no. It's more with Texas. Could Maybe it be? Thing, sure. There's built in vitriol based on Mountain West Conference days and bad feelings with TCU. But even that, it's been 13 years. I wouldn't years, call that so a rivalry. It's, so it's gone away. Right? It was a competitive rivalry when they got good at, for a couple years. In 2005, they were, people were upset about the 51 50 loss, and then BYU went back and upset a ranked team the next year, and then but it wasn't back and forth, and then Andy Dalton, the last time game day was here at the SPN, Andy Dalton and company, and like, frankly, embarrassed BYU. So oh, there's some history there. I, I feel yeah. like that, that has like the natural footing of something that could become a, rival, a real rivalry. Perhaps, but you got to have these moments. That where you're like, it's got to exist. Someone's got to throw a mouthpiece. They existed in the Mountain West TCU, but it's, it's been 13 I don't, years. I don't even feel that way about them in the Mountain West, frankly. Can BYU women's volleyball get a top 16 seed in the NCAA tournament without getting a win tonight over eighth ranked Ohio State? Yes, because San Diego is awesome, Jerem. If BYU figures it out, even if they lose against Ohio State tonight, if BYU can figure it out in the West Coast Conference and beat San Diego twice, if you beat San Diego twice, that's a team that beat Ohio State. Uh, or sorry, the beat Pitt and Ohio State, right? Mm -hmm. Then maybe you redeem yourself in conference. So yeah, BYU can still get it, but it'd probably be like a fit, like probably be like 15 or 16 overall. Yeah, BYU can still do it, but they're gonna have to win basically every other game, almost. You still play Utah on the road. That's a good game. You play San Diego twice. There's some good games with Pepperdine and LMU in league, but uh, BYU is gonna have to avoid some stumbles to get that top 16. You want that top 16 because that means you're hosting sure. the first and second sure. round. Yeah. Speaking of seeding and positioning for the postseason, BYU women's soccer certainly uh, aware of what they could do this year, but they haven't really produced to this point in the big matches aside from Ohio State. In fact, they've given up eight goals yeah. in the last four home matches. Not matches on the road, home matches. It just doesn't happen. Um, is this a big deal or no deal that BYU is struggling at home? It's a big deal um, because BYU never gave up eight in a four-game span last year at all. And I know it's not last year's team, but there's a lot, all but three players back from last year's team. I believe BYU is very good. Um, I think they're going to figure it out, but they, they gave up three goals the last ten games total of last year's season. Defensively, BYU has some things to figure out, and uh, tomorrow night we'll see it on display against UVU. Yeah, this, this is a big deal because BYU is pacing probably to host an opening round NCAA tournament game. But like, if this things continue in status quo and this keeps happening, that they're only going to get one home game and they got to go on the road. Yeah, and and last year they had to go on the road as well and go win, and sometimes that's what you got to do. Jackson Payne, our homie and editor at the Daily Universe, tweeted out this screenshot from last year's BYU Baylor game with the following. This is my biggest fear for Saturday with a gaping hole. Uh, uh, okay. 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 Then our own Hema Hamuli, producer extraordinaire here, retweeted it with a simple fix. Yeah! Keenan Peely will plug that hole. Did Hema nail the problem presented by Jackson? I tweeted it out yesterday. This is an elite tweet, <laughs> Jerem. An elite response to that concern from Jackson Payne by Hema. The stick figure Keenan Peely <laughs> says it all. He will make a huge impact tomorrow against Baylor. Healthy Peyton Wilgar, whose uh, labrum and shoulders aren't just slipping out. Max Tooley and Ben That'll Bywater be now not the main guys, but like they can just fill their roles on the outside joining Peely and Wilgar. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, and the top two rushers again for Baylor have uh, moved on to the NFL. So. 
it's, a, it's advantage. a different squad. Different squad. Yeah. Still a very good team. Not saying they're not. Take advantage of a home opportunity. That, that I mean, just if BYU can get the crowd in this game early, watch out. Well, crowd, just be in it no matter what. Like, don't wait for BYU to do something. Just be in it, okay? The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. All right, Jerem, game day eve. What would a win for BYU over Baylor mean? And in turn, what would a loss to Baylor mean for BYU in the grand scheme of the 2022 season? Okay, first off, let's talk about it. I love this matchup, right? Both teams are ranked. Bears versus Cougars, Dr. Pepper versus Coke. Yes. Uh, we don't, we're not going to get into it, but each school is affiliated with religion. Like There are similar and contrasting uh, conversations with this that seem very friendly. And it seems like it's like the neighbor that just moved in and we're getting to know each other. That's the relationship right now. I, I like this matchup. I'm excited for it. I don't call it a rivalry. We'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, if BYU wins, when BYU wins, Ooh. I believe BYU is going to win. I really okay. do. Okay. Top 10 win. The sixth time that will have ever happened. That's a, such a rare feat in, in BYU history, Spence. It would be one of the most notable wins in, in Cougar program history to beat Baylor. Now, and we think Baylor's going to be good this year. Like, this is a 9-plus win team, if not 11, right? They're very good. Uh, BYU suddenly flies up the rankings. Yes. They're inside yes. the top 14 at least, right? Maybe more. Is BYU then favored in Eugene next week, perhaps? The split with the big four is possible, like we've been talking about. 10-2-plus and two plus is still possible. Buzz about being a playoff contender starts to... Uh, uh, simmer a little bit, right? Big 12 confidence uh, versus the champs, not only for this year, but next year going into the league. And then you defend home turf. I think that's really important. BYU needs to defend home turf in order to get that split, in order to have 10 plus wins possible. That it would be one of the biggest wins in program history to win tomorrow. Yes. But how many times has BYU been ranked in this situation, right? A confident team ranked against Oklahoma, ranked against Miami where uh, you feel like, hey, BYU's got a team that can win this game. And, oh, by the way, Vegas feels BYU's favored. If BYU wins, you can expect, I don't know, probably an eight-spot jump at least in the rankings. I know some people are saying, ah, they should flip-flop places. Yeah, it's, not, it's probably not going to happen that way. But, again, to note, it, it doesn't happen very often that BYU faces a top-10 team, and certainly – the number of wins they have had against top 10 teams in history is limited, five and total. And there are freshmen on that, f that are now seniors f from the 2018 team that played against Wisconsin. Like there are some members of the team who are rostered who know what it's like to get it done. Now you're at home, go do it. Different venue, different energy, and certainly BYU has, they know what's on the line, massive opportunity. So not only is it just like a rankings boost, but Jaron, the belief that BYU could do something special this season now really starts to take hold if they figure out a way to beat Baylor. Because it's 2-0. Oh, yes. Who's to say, okay, we just knocked off number nine Baylor. We destroyed USF the week before. Why would BYU not believe that they could go to Eugene and beat an Oregon team that lost to Georgia 49-3 and is going to have an FCS opponent? Like, the belief now goes next level. This is the most likely of those wins. Why? Because BYU is healthy right now. Minus Puka Nakua and, you know, Gunnar Romney. But, like, I'm talking last year BYU got run over be because Baylor 1 was better and 2 BYU was banged up. That combination wasn't good for BYU. That, that, the score was 14. It didn't feel like a 14-point game. BYU will be at least number 13 in the rankings going to Oregon if they beat Baylor. Now, to be fair to the situation, while both of us feel really good about the matchup, the time of the game, certainly the setting, the location – all advantages to BYU. If Baylor comes in and picks up a road win, then the Bears are legit. Okay, they they might be the best team in the Big 12 again if they can handle this environment. And Blake Shapin, in his first true road hostile environment, comes away with a victory over BYU, then they might go back to back in the Big 12. Like they would be my front runner because this is a tall task for Baylor. Yes. If BYU is competitive. And in the previous five wins they've had over top ten teams, all have been one score, as you pointed one out. We discussed score. this after the show a couple Tight. of days ago. It would be a close game. If BYU loses close, maybe they stay in the top 25. But, but probably history not. would say that ah, they probably drop dropping just out. I would guess that BYU's out. Yeah. 
and other things that could happen if BYU loses. Um, nine and three regular season expectation is probably where it slides for me. Yeah, yep. Same for you. Okay. One and three versus the big four is uh, a possibility. You hope you can win two of the next three, but at Oregon, that hey, you, BYU can still go win at Oregon. Notre Dame feels like uh, a tough game. That's the most likely loss of the season, but hey, maybe BYU pulls off the upset. Arkansas is going to be a real physical team, kind of in that same spot that Baylor was last year, um, where, hey, is BYU beat up? Are they ready for K.J. Jefferson, a 240-pound quarterback? Yeah, like, is, is Arkansas beat up because they go through a gauntlet say, before yeah. they come to Provo? Great point, great point. Um, and then, yeah, going 0-2 versus Baylor in back-to-back years before you go into the Big 12, it's like, all right, you know what? BYU, BYU had to kiss the ring, I guess, <laughs> of the champs and the preseason champs, if you will, of the league. So, it's a big game. Um, BYU has more on the line than Baylor, by the way. BYU season a lot more rides on this, win, winning this than Baylor. Baylor has the Big 12. We're going to start to experience that again next year for the first time in a long time, people, where we go, oh, non-con wasn't what we wanted, but guess what? If we show up in league, we can still go to a great bowl game. That, And I'm talking like if you win the league, obviously you could be in the playoff if you're an automatic champ, the expanded playoff in a couple of years kind of thing. Here's the other element of this game that I really like that is a benefit to BYU. While it is late, and we know that a lot of the East Coast voters, and they'll probably go to bed and figure out what happened the next morning, but it's one of only three ranked versus ranked matchups, and we believe it's the best ranked matchup in all of college football. So yeah. a lot of natural attention will be on this game. Just maybe some of those East Coast viewers are like, I'll stay up just a little bit longer because this is the best game. So perform really well in the first half. This is the opportunity. <laughs> Aside from beating Notre Dame, this is BYU's best opportunity to, quote-unquote, make the statement for the national writers. Yes. This is the best opportunity. And then next week again at Oregon, early Fox game, national. I mean, it's going to be big time. By the way, wear royal to every game this year. That's the, that's the, uh, you know, the direction received. Wear royal to every game. Okay, topic two, game day guarantees. We did this last week. You went foe for foe. I think I went one for four. Okay. Uh, what do you have this week? All right, my first guarantee, Jerem, game day guarantee. And I'm going with what Coach Dave Aranda just alluded to in his press conference. Say, say it like Dave, though. Uh, I believe that uh, Jaron Hall will have at least a 3-to-1 TD to turnover ratio, Jerem. So, uh, Jerem Hall's – or J- Jerem. Jerem. Jerem Hall, I like him Jaren even more Hall. now. I like Jaren him a lot. Hall, Jerem. Thank you. Will have at least a 3 to 1 TD to turnover ratio. So whether that's Ooh. a fumble or an interception, he's going to produce Jerem Hall. 3 to Hall's, 1. He's going to show up in a big way. He will at, be responsible for at least 3 touchdowns whether with his feet yeah. or with his arm or catching. And he might not turn the ball over at all. I'm going to give him a little bit of room to maybe deal with a fumble because of Baylor's uh, pass rush up front, yeah. really good, really strong, or an interception. But the point is, Jaron Hall's going to play a great game with the national spotlight. I guarantee 3-1 to one TD to turn over. Ratio. I guarantee it. Number two, pretty simple and straightforward. The first team to 20 points is going to win this game, Jaron. The first, first to, to 20. 20. Okay. First to 20. So if BYU has a quick start, like they did against Utah and Arizona State last year, mm-hmm. and they held on with the emotion of that late-night crowd. Where were those games played? Over played at Lavelle Edwards What time did those kick? 8-15 okay. kick. Into, well, 8 yeah. yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> First team to 20 wins the game. I guarantee it. You'll like the way you look. And my bold guarantee, and this is crazy based on what happened last year. Talk to me, Brian Logan. BYU will outrush Baylor Ooh. in this game. Baylor if so, BYU three, wins. Baylor ran for 303 yards against BYU last year. The Cougars... Combined for 67 rushing yards. Five sacks, took that number way down, right? Yeah. I'm hoping that BYU goes, you know, 150 plus and they can hold the Bears to a similar. It's going to be close, but I think BYU will outrush Baylor. Yes. What are your Friday guarantees? You already gained 110 in the game, by the way. Lost a bunch with the sacks. Okay, number one, Chris Brooks will score a rushing touchdown. I just think he's going to be a machine this year and go for 14 plus. Okay. Um, he'll be the 15th player in BYU history with, 12, with uh, you know, that number. Blake Shapin will throw an interception. Okay. It's second true road game. His first real test right at Kansas State. Not the same as what he's going to see here. He didn't play in the bowl game, by the way, yeah. because he was injured. Yes. The biggest to game clarify. he played in was the yep. Big 12 championship. Which is a huge game. That knocked BYU out of the New Year's Six, perhaps. 
but it's not a road game. So if you're upset about BYU not being in the New Year's Six uh, last year, obviously uh, within BYU's control. Take it things, out on Baylor. Take it out on Blake Chapin, who uh, beat Oklahoma State. Okay, and number three, Baylor will force a turnover. Just know that it's going to happen. They've done this in 23 straight games, okay? I believe it will happen again. They're plus 21. Can BYU overcome it? Can it be a turnover that doesn't matter, meaning they, they don't score off of that, right? Um, that's the hope, that – if Baylor forced a turnover, which I think they will, they're going to do it again. If BYU's clean the whole game, you they're going to win. You certainly help yourself, right? That's not everything, but it at least gives you a chance. Oh yeah, you want to talk about guarantees? If BYU has zero turnovers, one hundred percent they will win this game. Ooh, zero turnovers, a, yeah, hundred percent at home in yeah. that scenario. But what if Baylor doesn't turn it over? It's just even. I don't right? care. Yeah. Zero turnovers, no momentum plays to help Baylor on the road. BYU's going to win the game. I love it. I just want BYU to win. I don't care how. But to your point. Two nothing. I'd take it right now. To our guarantees, like, you think Baylor's going to force turnover, and I gave some slack to Jaron Hall to have a turnover because Baylor's We've, defense is so opportunistic. We think a turnover is happening, which is not even a crazy guess given that Baylor's done it so, so often so recently. That wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear and catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast Every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on BYU TV and BYU Radio.